thousands and thousands of views every day and the question is uh, and we get a lot of bloggers with your same interests they're like I want to talk about the big issues well the big issues are really important but you have to narrow that focus down uh, I mean uh, people call it hyper local and uh, I would make it even more simple your personal experiences is what people want to know about and that is where you have to grow your idea from so yes you have to work on human indifference, but identify exactly where you want to begin that thing from. And if it's a personal thing, something you've seen, something you've witnessed, you can record that, you can bring it forward on many social platforms. I can give you one example of a tweet which went viral. And that was uh, that, um, you know, this March we will only talk about education emergency and cricket. Shaila Afridi and education emergency. When you tie and try the thing during work of an education emergency, everyone talks about it. So I think you, know, you, need to, you need to link it up with something that sells. I think Steve's point is particularly key on messaging. Each medium is not the same. So rather than take a hammer approach and push out the same messaging on Facebook, on Twitter, it's better to use a scalpel like she's talking about and really differentiate it to your audience. Steph? Yeah, and even though that's a, that's a terrific idea, always recognize this goes for you or anyone else up here with an idea of starting something new. Look around in your own backyard and abroad and see who's doing something similar. Sometimes it's great to collaborate or see if you can replicate a model that's been successful that works with what your mint particular you don't have to risk your own safety or security by posting things on your Facebook wall. You also can't be anonymous on Facebook legally, but you can share these things privately and email to journalists and look at how other people are doing it. Always look at the best practices of others that are being successful in what you're trying to achieve. Again, that's a universal tool uh, or way of doing things that can work for all of you. I think that's a really good point, and we should take a step back for a second and realize that as unique as everyone's causes are, as important as everyone's issues are, um, it's been done before. People have been active on social causes for generations, since the beginning of humanity. And at no point in time do we to feel like, one, we're alone, or two, we have to reinvent the wheel. Twitter has like, uh, changed my life. Uh, basically, the resources come to you, uh, because all I've done really is, being the web editor, I have an important role to play. I don't have too much time to tweet, but my presence there allows people to approach me. So I'm always checking my replies, I'm always checking my direct messages, and as such, I get tons of people bringing in conversations, bringing in ideas, telling me what they want to see on our website, uh, giving me ideas on like what they want to blog about, and they say, why don't you take up this issue? I'm like, why don't you write about it? You know, just write back to me and we will carry your piece. I mean, this, I mean, I found Twitter to be extremely useful this way. Let me. You know, well, let's, let's take a step back on Twitter. Because I think a lot of people sign up for a Twitter account and they say, okay, now what? Can you talk about maybe how to get the most use of Twitter? Because signing up is really only the beginning and it's not helpful. Uh, really, when I, when I actually carry out Twitter workshop, and in that I always tell people, the first thing you've got to do is you have to identify all the people you're really, really interested in following it. Because if you're going, you have to interact and engage with others. Otherwise, it's not going to be such an interesting tool. Add some of the news feeds you like. Start following the people you really, really care about. Not the celebrities. Find the people who actually matter. And once you start, and once you start seeing their tweets, respond to them. Because, you know, I always tell people, hello, I want the response. And once I get the response, we're engaging and we're in the dialogue. And beyond that, that is where Twitter becomes really interesting. So my advice is always add a whole bunch of people. And in fact, in the Express Tribune, what we did was we created a list of 150 people everyone in Pakistan should follow. So, you know, you can just go search Trip 140. And you'll find, oh, yeah, it was 140, sorry, to be with the Twitter 140 character. You'll find 140 characters of Pakistan worth following. It, it includes journalists, includes media personalities, it includes your politicians, so you can reach out to them. Uh, follow these people and start engaging with them. That's what I would say. You have written 500 words. You cannot get it out there unless somebody comes to your blog. But when you write a smart, funny response in 140 characters, then you, you tell people to come here. They do. And all the people who then follow you, when they like it, they retweet it. 
So basically, if you have 5,000 followers and your 5,000 followers have, let's say, 200 followers each, you can imagine the number. And then it gets, it gets retweeted and retweeted and retweeted. So, I mean, the audience is unlimited, basically. Um, you, have, you can write, but I think in order to develop a brand, you need something like Twitter. But this, the reason I think I get a lot of hits uh, is that whatever I write, I genuinely feel about it. I am passionate about whatever I write. Um, and if you do that, and if you do that well, you get response. Um, I mean, a lot of people say that you know you have to follow something, you have you have to build your niche market. I think my niche market is the urban English-speaking uh, Pakistani who likes something smart and funny. And I think I have that uh, corner. And I think you can do that too if you if you know what you're what you're talking about and sort of you know just get it out there. I think Tazine's point is something that we should particularly focus on for a moment, moment, which is that these technologies reward authenticity. Um, if it's bullshit, it's going to sound like bullshit on Twitter, on Facebook. And I think we should look at these as the same way we look at having a conversation with someone else. If you're authentic, if you're speaking from your heart, if you're speaking about things you care about, that's going to come through. If you're issuing like a press release, nobody's going to care, and more importantly, no one's going to take action as a result. So authenticity is key at all times. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, I'm going to be brutally honest, this comes down to your intention. When you're writing, when you're reporting, or when you're posting, if, if your intention is to build a fan club, nobody's going to become a member. If your intention is to report relevant, breaking news, and to be a team player, and acknowledge your co-workers and associates and other citizen journalists out there by sharing what they have to say, you're going to build an audience. The internet's a crowded place. A lot of people yelling. You have to provide something unique for them to come to you as opposed to all the other places they can just as easily go. And I, I just want to, uh, uh, two quick things. One, look out. Uh, you can update your Twitter using SMS and that's uh, applicable in Pakistan as well. Uh, you can Google it and you'll find out how to do that. Yeah. And uh, secondly, uh, you said, well, I'm running my personal blog. It's not doing so great. Here's what you do. If you have great content and you've written 600 words, don't waste your content. Fine, it's sitting on your blog, it's not doing so great. Forward it to somebody. It's not like the big main websites are like uh, stealing you away or that personal blogs are gonna die. If you have something great to say, we will cross post it and uh, we will send a link back. That, this is good practice which will slowly come to Pakistan, but we will send a link back to your personal blog so people can start following you and understand who you are. Uh, that's important and beyond that, uh, uh, You'd be surprised at what will happen once you approach a website uh, to take you forward and to the mainstream. Don't be shy. So if you have good content, send it to the Express Review. Be bold, send it to the Guardian. You never know, they might take your piece. Uh, we had a blogger who wrote for us for the first time to the Express Tribune. He wrote about uh, Meena Malik, which is you know, a celebrity, not a, not a very large issue. And she just tackled this Mufti Saab. Everyone knows about that. Mufti Saab, he kya baat hui. So he wrote about that and uh, it was his first time writing, university student, no specialization. We took his blog from his personal post and we cross-posted basically. And that blog was picked up by the New York Times and they quoted it in the lead, which is one of their blogs. And uh, they quoted him, they said, this guy said this, he's just a regular university student and he made a great point in point. So you never know where you'll reach. The point is you have to make that effort to take those two extra steps. If you have the great content, it will get places, uh, but you can make these extra moves to get it. What happens is that when, you, when people go online, they do it for two purposes. They either want to be informed or they want to be entertained. So you have to declare what you want to do, whether you want to, want to entertain people or to inform people. And secondly, um, what, what happens is that when you write something which is, um, which sort of, you know, which, has, which is, which is um, I mean, I'm talking, for instance, uh, we have uh, somebody here from, uh, from, who works for a news agency. What happened was that I wrote a blog, uh, which was basically detailing my um, Twitter fight with a British celebrity, um, Jemima Khan. It was picked up by presidents of India, and next day it was in all major Indian newspapers. So, I mean, you don't really know that, you know, and, and that sort of increased the, the traffic to my blog um, tremendously. I got like 800 followers in one day. So, I mean, you, you don't really know what happens and what, what sort of catches people's eye and what uh, sort of, what can take you to the next level. Yeah, as much as the media would like us to believe that Facebook 
brought down Mubarak. Um, Facebook didn't really do that. People did. And I think it's very important that, that we recognize that just because we put it out on Facebook or on Twitter or on blog doesn't mean that, that anything's going to happen as a result. Um, it, it's, these are tools that we can use. They're not ends into themselves. They're means. And I think we need to ex not expect that by putting something on Facebook, change is going to happen. This is just one more way of helping to affect you ended up in Iraq and now you're like, well, my Facebook page won't expand. We're releasing all these blogs on our blog site. It's not going anywhere. We're not getting enough Twitter followers. Well, on Twitter, are you reaching out to those opinion leaders who might increase traffic to your website? People you might engage with in an average conversation and then later it might turn into something where they might comment on your own thing or they might retweet one of your uh, articles. That's what you need to be doing. Sure, you set up a Facebook group, but have you considered perhaps running an ad campaign targeting people directly about your issue? Not just something broad and abstract, but directly, specifically about what you're talking about. These are the things you need to do. Or, like what I said earlier, have you been reaching out to the website who might have a greater number amount of traffic to bring those people in? Uh, because a lot of times people are very interested in your issue, but uh, they don't know how to reach you. So yes, it's very important to be out there, but also be proactive in trying to reach out to people yeah? and organizations. He's right. This is the thing. I'm going to jump in real quick. If you build it, they don't just come. There are many tools out there that will help you engage a larger audience. They help you measure, they help uh, your, who's, how many people are clicking on your article, or how many people are retweeting. They help you schedule your posts, and they help you spread the message by making sure that what you're tweeting is also being posted at a different time on Facebook, or on Google+, and so on and so forth. Uh, or on your Tumblr blog. There are a lot of different ways to spread your message, but you have to be active about it, just like if you're socializing at a party. You have to go out and talk to talk to the different people. Nobody's just going to come to you. Um, I would like to add one more thing. Uh, when you're out there on social media, you have to be consistent. You cannot start blogging and stop it. You cannot have a page, Facebook page which has not been updated in the past 10 days. You have, you have to be active and you have to be consistent. Because if you, if you don't do that, then you will be disappointing your audience. You know, they, they, want, they want to come back for more. And if they're not getting that, they would not come back again. So the question was, you know, the, the blocking of pages on Facebook. I think that that's something we need to all be aware of, is that these platforms we're using aren't totally open or free. They're proprietary. In this case, Facebook has its own terms of use, and they make their own rules. And the reality is, that we're beholden to those rules. You know, we've got over to their house to play. At their house, they make the rules. It doesn't mean that those are the right rules or, um, or that those are injustice in some way, but at the same time, that's what we're dealing with on these platforms. Does anyone else make sense on that? It's a, it it uh, sucks, dude, but that's the way it is. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can say Facebook is evil, sure, and they're trying to block certain things, but uh, if you don't like it, you can always move off, find another platform, and trust me, if Facebook wasn't that good, uh, people wouldn't be using it. If it was really that restrictive, people wouldn't be using it. Sure, it makes mistakes. Uh, let's give it that. It's run and, by humans. Uh, huh? It's run by humans. I mean, listen, almost nearly one billion people are using Facebook, right? But that is not the only tool, especially in this region. There are several other platform forms, including like uh, Midi's Peace is a good one. Um, I'll have to think of a few others, but also remember these are tools that we're using online to promote offline action. And, and, and they're developing. So you say that uh, they blog some, uh, the pages about Palestine. Well, did you go blog about it? And I'm sure a Facebook representative would have noticed that. So it's an ongoing process. Yes, we should criticize, but we should also appreciate where, uh, you know, we have to give Don't credit. Don't criticize without a solution. And I think that Facebook actually does a really good job. The Palestinian example is one that gets, I think, a lot of press and attention just because the issue itself is so controversial. But um, they're very consistent with what they remove. It's not like they're choosing to gang up on the Palestinians or something. Because like it, it changes the mindset of one person, so I can achieve my target. That's awesome. That's great. I just, I just wanted to add something about that Facebook likes thing. Uh, don't, don't knock it. it. It's actually a really useful tool. Uh, let me give you a very straight and simple example on our, uh, I keep coming back to our website, but take any website which has a Facebook integrated like button. The great thing about likes is that everyone wants a response. Even the most, uh, you know, uh, intellectuals, 
science leader, whatever, he's reading his article and he's checking those Facebook likes. So he wants to know who's actually going to be trending and who's actually uh, reaching the audience in some way. In fact, to the extent that some of our op-ed writers are always like, Chansey, uh, how much traffic did our thing get? Oh, this is a good issue to write on because hey, it's getting some traffic, it's getting me some leverage as well as an opinion leader. We even have, uh, I mean, we want to be social on our website, so we will have comments open on every single thing. That's the social aspect of journalism. What happens is, a lot of our op-ed writers, all these old guys who you would assume would not be, you know, web savvy at all, suddenly are writing entire op-eds in response to a single comment left on their article. So don't knock the Facebook likes, don't knock the people who are just sitting online. Keyboard activists have a role, perhaps not a major one, but it's still important. One more thing. Um, you see what happens is that we all go online and I think we all do it because we want our voice to be heard, right? I don't think, I mean, at the sort of, you know, you, do you really want to keep up with somebody, you know, you knocked off in, in, in the playground in eighth grade? You actually go to Facebook and you be friends with them because you want, you know, you, you to be out there. You want people to know you, to like you, to, to sort of, you know, to talk about you. This isn't human nature. We can't deny that. So I think numbers are very important because what you have to say, it has to go to a lot of people. And I mean, the more the, uh, the more the people, uh, the number of people that get the message, I think that, that makes a lot of difference. You can't knock it off. I would just say we have time for a few more questions.